So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Stephen Hicks, Department of Clinical Neurology, Oxford University, and John Worsfold, Senior Accessibility Specialist with RNIB. Good morning, everybody. My name is John Worsfold from RNIB Solutions. Um, thank you, John. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking, myself and Stephen Hicks, are going to be talking about um, the next step, if you like, or, or enhancing personal use of mobile technology in the form of wearable technology. And um, the, the title of the presentation is the Oxford Enhanced Vision. <coughs> The running order of, of the presentation for the next 20, 25 minutes is going to be um, an outline of the project, how this came about, how we got started, and then we will hand over to Stephen to explain the technicalities of what these things are, how they work, and what the benefits, are, and, and why this is really groundbreaking, and why this is really initiative. And then we'll come back to a quick summary of what we plan to do with these things. So. Strategically, um, this has, has formed part of a wayfinding programme of work within RNIB. And those of you that were here last year, I talked about the wayfinding pro project and what we, we were doing. It's been a year and I thought I'd, I'd sort of summarise that for you. So we're told there are issues. We know there are issues out there. And what we've been doing is understanding those and cataloguing those um, from the point of view of creating evidence of these issues and the, the issues that happen in everyday lives that we've heard, of, heard about um, over the last day or so. We've also been identifying what's out there, what's best practice, what's best in class, what mobile technologies or technologies are out there to help people get around and find their way. <coughs> we've also been developing some solutions. Some solutions have... Um, ended in failure, some solutions have actually um, progressed to the next stage. And we've also set the ball rolling on future developments. As Kevin said, we've got to look forward to what's happening in the next five, ten years. And so we've set the ball rolling on some initiatives. And a couple of years ago, we set the ball rolling on the assistive vision glasses. So during the research within the Wayfinding Project, and I'm sure that this will not come to any surprise to any of you, uh, one of the biggest problems was the detection of both temporary and fixed objects within somebody's surroundings. What's in front of me? How do I know what it is? How do I avoid it? There are products out there. There are things like the UltraCane and ultrasonic sensors. We've even got our own eyeglasses. But they have limited success. They inform you there's something there, but they don't necessarily tell you what it is. So following that research, we um, identified Stephen and his colleagues from Nuffield Department of Clinical Neurosciences at Oxford, and they were in the middle of a funded feasibility study at looking at um, the possibility of improving spatial awareness using visual computation. The prototype that they showed us when we, we engaged with them. It was a very, very stylish and sleek <laughs> pair of ski goggles. The reason for the laughter is that there's a, an image on the screen of a, a very Heath <coughs> Robinson and very clunky prototype. We as RNIB wanted to know what the benefits that prototype might offer. So we conducted some trials with blind and partially sighted participants and the results were incredibly positive. We tested with a range of sight conditions from people that had 3 in 60, uh, 6 in 60 range of, of sight, uh, macular degeneration, um, glaucoma, retinitis pigmentosa. And from our point of view, the, the intuitiveness or the main difference with this innovation was that it allowed somebody to utilise their own residual vision, whatever that may be, and 90% and of people have some form of residual vision, and it presented back the real world in a very intuitive way that the human brain could understand. So it's a very non-invasive but very intuitive method. And following that, we've been collaborating with Stephen for the last 24 months. 
We're developing a pair of high-tech, yet inexpensive and inconspicuous portable wearable device that processes inputs from visual sensors. The idea is that provides the enhanced awareness of your surroundings to an individual in a very intuitive way. So rather than me carrying on about the introduction, let me introduce Stephen. He can explain all about the glasses, how they work, and show you some <coughs> prototypes. Stephen. Okay. Thanks very much, John, for that great introduction. And thanks for the opportunity to present our work here. It's, it's a, real, a real privilege. As John said, we've been working on a project to build a pair of glasses which can make use of the remaining sight that many people still have. This can either be uh, central vision, peripheral, um, or, or a range of, of different levels of contrast and colour sensitivity. I do work with, with several people on this. It's not just myself, but um, uh, Chris Kennard is the leader of our group and Professor Phil Tor is a, a computer vision expert who, um, who I think touches on a lot of what um, the, the, the discussion that Kevin was, was talking about about being able to recognise things in the world and, um, and use computers in order to augment your ability to see these things. So on the right here, there's an image of the design that we're aiming towards, which is a, a relatively inconspicuous looking pair of glasses. The two key points they have, are they have a transparent display, which puts information on there, which is very um, unambiguous. It's not high resolution, it's not clear, uh, it's not focusable, but it's spatially relevant. So a nearby object becomes very bright and you can see it, um, and spaces around where it's safe to walk become um, uh, transparent. The key thing is that they have cameras in the um, arms of the, of the glasses. Well, it depends where the, where the cameras go in the end. And these pick up uh, nearby ob objects and a bit, of com uh, a bit of computation puts them together to make it into a display. So I'll walk you through some of the reasons we got to this position and, and show you a demonstration of, of how they work. So we started actually looking at um, uh, retinal implants a couple of years ago. And retinal implants are an amazing piece of technology which are emerging as a, as a potential um, augmentation for people with the right type of blindness. What it is is a small electronic chip that's implanted in the retina at different levels depending on which version you go for. And it interfaces with the ganglion cells which are large, uh, the, kind of the, the driving powerhouse of the eye which send the signals back to the, to the brain. Now this chip can make use of uh, remaining sight uh, they can, it can get a small amount of information and turn into a bright phosphine. So you can get grayscale images which allow you to recognise a contour, potentially a person. But as you may be able to see, there's a video running at the moment showing uh, whereabouts it goes into the eye. Where, where we started doing our work was looking at what can actually people see with a retinal implant. Is this small chip uh, good enough for, for what you would consider to be useful sight? So we were able to simulate that. Uh, we ran a, ran a study um, in 2010 using healthy controls. And we emulated that on display. And on, I've got a couple of images here. I'm sorry, this presentation is a little <coughs> image heavy. I'll, I'll do my best to describe them as we go through. We simulated the experience of a, of a retinal prosthetic, which is a 40 by 40 pixel array, which is very small and, and um, attached to the eye. As you can see in these pictures, it shows the simulation of what a face would look like and what, a, what the top letter of a Snellen chart will look like. This is, this is the best case scenario, and in fact, it's, uh, the trials that are going through at the moment at Oxford and, and other places are showing that it's still a long way to go. The, the key thing that we realised when we did this study is that there's a, lot of there's a lot of potential for this display to show more, but if you just take your camera image and turn it into uh, a projection on your eye, you're picking up on contrast and textures and, and ambiguous things that aren't necessarily the most important thing for you right now. So we thought, well, what can we do? Can we get computers, essentially, to do, this, to do image processing, processing on this? Simplify the display down so it's something which is uh, relevant for the person and reduce the content of it so it's really easy to use. So, we, so once you can get the computer to do some of the imaging, perhaps there was the other motivation is perhaps you can make it so it's more widely applicable. A retinal implant is only for particular types of blindness. It's a very expensive, experimental procedure. It's surgical as well, which is, which is an advantage in some respects because of the ability to hide all the uh, components, but it may not be right for everyone. So our, our two key motivations for this project were to get computers to do the recognition of objects and make it useful for people, and to make it widely applicable. So hence, hence the, the idea of making a pair of glasses for this. 
So this is where we met John, and we've been funded by the NIHR, um, their Invention for Innovation project for the, uh, the last two years, and we have one more year of this project to go. So what can you do with computer vision? So as, um, as Kevin was talking about, and as I'll, I'll describe a little bit, we can do object recognition, we can do face, face recognition. As you see some of the um, exhibitors out there, obviously uh, text is becoming uh, more easy to, to process with a computer as well. But if you're looking for a, a navigational aid, is it feasible to do real-world object recognition on everything? Do I want to detect uh, the, the several the hundred or so people in this room? Uh, do I, is it possible even for my computer to do that? So we started to think, what is it actually, what actually are we trying to do? And what sort of information do we need to get to a person to allow them primarily to avoid obstacles and, if possible, to get them to better uh, goal-directed activities, so to a bus stop or to a shop, to improve some of the independence of being able to walk around in a similar way that you would use um, People would use a cane or a guide dog or, or a personal assistant. So we, we struck on the idea of depth imaging. So rather than using a, a conventional camera to pick up objects, we use either a pair of cameras or uh, uh, devices like the Kinect. In fact, the Microsoft Kinect was a, a, a nice way to step through some of these technological hurdles. It's nice to have um, gaming technology, which you know, is good fun to, to build into something like this. The image I have on the screen here, on the left-hand side, you have just a person standing next to a partition. If I reduce that down into just a small grayscale or a high contrast image, what I'd really see is a bright window behind, the, the dark partition would disappear. What we've done instead is we, we image it in terms of depth. So it makes it actually very simple as a process. Nearby things we turn into brightness and things that are further away are darker. The reason we choose that, that way is that once we get to the stage where we've got a transparent display, we want to put up bright, unambiguous information to show you there's a nearby obstacle and leave the gaps in between for where you can tell that there's, it's safe to walk. There's no, there's no hazards here. And when you run this algorithm on a display, what you get is on the right-hand side here. The person is very clear. In fact, their, their shape is well preserved. And on the right-hand side, the partition, the, at least the near part of the partition, is easy to see. And you can detect that there's a gap between that. Once, these, once you actually see a video of this, it even becomes even more clear because the human form is so easily recognised by us. We're, um, I'm not sure if John mentioned this at the beginning, but really the, the purpose is that the, the idea is that we all have uh, you know, this great brain um, that's, that's running along you know, all the time. We're very used to uh, the natural size and the natural movement of, of lots of objects. But often what's the case is the retina is just letting, letting us down. It's not getting enough data into the visual cortex. So we want to be able to provide um, uh, useful and um, situational and, and expected information so the brain can then piece it together and say, OK, that's a person. That's a, a wall. These are steps. Let me show you then a video of what this looks like. So this is the early prototype that, that John mentioned. Here we have a, a pair of ski goggles. We were very proud of it at the time. We thought it looked awesome with a uh, depth camera across the top. Now, what's, this is a very early version. You can see the, the pixels here are very, very large. What, what we're showing here is nearby objects, in this case, my coworker Ian, is standing in front and waving his hand. On the display is a bright, a very crude, but a bright um, representation of him. Let me run that one more time if I can. But also what's important is the walls pop up. So the nearby um, pillars and the wall on the right-hand side and this means that you can really easily tell if you've got just enough sight, you can tell that here's something here. Um, as you start to learn to use this device, you can tell that this is the person waving their hand. We were able to run a, a pilot study with, with the help of John to, um, to move this around, uh, to, to, um, to test this out. Let me talk about that in a moment. The second question once we, uh, is to look at the actual way in which we want to um, build this into a, a useful pair of glasses. So what's the right form factor? Now, we've got a camera, we've got a display, we've got a computer, which is going to be on a, a lanyard, at least at the beginning. Now, it needs to look acceptable in the environment. Now, the, um, there's already a champion of these wearable devices in the um, in science fiction literature, which is Geordie LaForge, who wears a uh, full visor across his eyes and can see you know, x-rays and things like that. This is, I'm sure a lot of people would be quite fine with this, but it may not be the, the, the exactly the right format. In fact, NASA back in the 90s made a, a, a device, which is a magnifying CCTV wearable thing, which they also called the Geordie. What we want to do is make something which is more acceptable. So we, we, we reduced the, the size of the electronics. We brought it into a transparent form. And in fact, we've started to work with a, a, a system a device, which, is, which I've got here. This is a, a prototype that we've been working on this the last couple of months. We want to make something which is lightweight. 
something which is affordable. It's, it's extremely important for us to make it affordable. Inconspicuous, so if you, yeah, and actually as I was talking to Stephen King last night, um, he was saying it's very important that they look stylish as well, and we'll, we'll definitely focus on that. We want it to be widely useful, so it has to have a range of different abilities to show brightness, contrast, and color. Uh, something which we can calibrate for individual users. So the, um, we've, we've worked out routines in which we can adapt the display to look at people who have got only central vision, in which case we shrink the display that we're giving down towards the centre and provide potentially that peripheral um, vision that, that Neil mentioned about being able to get um, awareness from the side. Uh, if people have only uh, peripheral vision and not much in the way of centre, we can spread the display out so it fills up the, the remaining areas of sight. And in fact, that calibration routine is relatively straightforward and we've been working on that quite a bit. But the key thing, I think, really is that it's an intuitive device. We, could, we want to be able to approach a, a wide range of people with a wide range of technological experience and want to have something which people don't have to learn too much. They want to be able to pick up and try out and go, oh, yeah, I get, I get that. And as they take it home over a couple of days, they start to become more and more adept. With the, with the aim that they'll become uh, more um, empowered to, to walk out in uh, environments that are ambiguous, such as the evening or unusual light or unfamiliar environments. With the RNIB back in 2011, we ran a, a pilot study. We were looking uh, at how quickly people can learn to use these uh, glasses. And this was using our ski goggle version. This is actually graphs from Healthy Controls, uh, looking at how quickly you could pick it up work out what this depth means and avoid obstacles. And everyone was very, very good at it, reduce the number of interactions with obstacles and were able to complete our small courses um, uh, more and more quickly. We've now repeated this over the last couple of months up, at, um, up in Oxford with sight impaired people and in a much larger environment and it's working very well. The conditions we tried to test as broad a condition as possible, so from macular degeneration, which was uh, obviously the, one of the, the, main, <coughs> the main group to, to approach, but also uh, ranges of uh, retinal dystrophies, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, stargarts, which is, which is particularly um, useful, uh, particularly good with this, uh, diabetic retinopathy. And the, to really summarise what we're finding is that the awareness of light sources and your ability to point to nearby obstacles, you, you pick up almost instantly. It's, it's intuitive, you say, here's a bright thing, as I move my head around, it's, it's over there. People can do that within a couple of minutes. The recognition of whether something's a person or a static object follows very, very quickly. And in fact, what I do is I stand in front, move my arms, walk forward and backwards, and people can then detect me um, at, at ranges of uh, up to six or seven metres, depending on, on, their, on the amount of contrast sensitivity they have. And finally, free walking and obstacle detection, which is the main aim, um, comes within about 10 or 15 minutes. People are, um, and this isn't, this isn't perfect, right? This is our first version. It's still got some ways to go in, in order to improve it. But, but people are able to intuitively tell that this is a, a pillar or a wall uh, the one that we're working on now is whether it's a small step, um, either up or down. The prototype that we've been using for this still isn't the most attractive one. So on the screen here I have a, a headset with higher resolution displays and an inbuilt camera. But it shows you a nice version of what it looks like on the inside. And again, apologies for the visual content here. This is, on, this is the user side now. What you see is um, an OLED display. So the same, same thing as, a, as actually the um, old Nokia phones, same, the same resolution as that. Showing now nearby things as a bright object and darker regions being further and further away. Um, I'm not sure if I have a laser pointer here, but behind the headband there's a, a small cardboard box which is being picked up on this display as a small, a small bright rectangle. Now I'll show you a video of what that looks like. And here's a, a co-worker, Tom, giving some waves. He's standing in the corridor and, and as he moves around, the camera instantly uh, tracks him, shows um, uh, enough pixels. Now you will appreciate that this is a, a crude image. It's only 20 by 16 pixels. But that's actually, it's, it's becoming almost enough in order to get quite realistic recognize, uh, recognizing objects. Oh, there's actually a fair bit more of that video to go. Let me see if it's possible to play it again. It won't, it won't show again. But the, the, one of the key things is that this is actually a camera which works in the dark. So as you uh, work in, walk into completely low light or pitch black, it will still pick up um, ob objects in front, which is obviously a, a key thing. Now where we've then gone on from here is we've started to take into account the actual wearability of it. No one's going to be wanting to wear a headset or an OLED display, um, at least ob obscures their eyes. So we've moved into this one now, which is a transparent display. So it shows the same images on top. And I have to confess, this actually doesn't have the camera built in because 
the camera is the last uh, technical hurdle for us, and we've, we've actually just recently found a manufacturer who can probably solve this for us. A small camera across the top, a transparent display, um, and cables running at the moment down to a, a processor which is performing the, um, the work. Now this, we're, we've got 12 months more of this project, and so what we're doing is um, a range of user testing to explore how well people can pick this up, um, whether it works outside, um, also to, to gauge the, um, the best scenarios for it to work in. But I think where it becomes really exciting is, is when we start moving beyond simple obstacle detection and start looking at some of the more semantic information which you can pick up from the environment. And this is where we've been working with John in order to um, identify the, the key areas that we need to focus on. Now I mentioned Phil Tor, who's a computer vision expert in, in Oxford, actually in Brooks, but moving to Oxford University. His main work really is in semantic imaging, so being able to identify where an exit is, uh, where a bathroom is, where, and we're working particularly on, on buses. So finding where bus stops are and uh, having a go at reading what the number is to help give a bit of a heads up about the, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the information that's really relevant to you. And what's very nice is that we don't have to do that much of the technological development. We build the cameras and the displays. In fact, we just use essentially off-the-shelf cameras and displays. Whereas everybody else, as the two previous speakers have, have talked about, is that there's so much content, so much um, image processing going on in mobile devices. Uh, people who are working on text recognition or um, uh, yeah, high level image processing, that really what we're trying to be able to do is link this in uh, to that sort of development, being able to link our, link our work to phones so we can do mapping and extend the, the usability into uh, smaller day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, while, while still retaining the ability to avoid obstacles. Now let me pass finally on to John just to, just to wrap up. Okay, so um, Stephen's explained about the technology uh, and how it's pushing the, the boundaries and that's all well and good and as, as has been said a number of times in, in the conference, technology is a means to an end. So what I'd like to do now is finish with, with what that really meant when we were uh, trialling this with participants. What, what impact, what benefit did it actually have? And I've got some quotes that I'd like to share with you. So with the participants, with the various eye conditions and within 15 minutes of using the ski goggle prototypes, we got quotes like, gosh, it's my leg. <coughs> Seeing their legs for the first time. We got... I don't care how much this costs if it helps me be more independent. We got, it's better than my retinal implant. Imagine the evasive procedure that, was went, th that went through and within 15 minutes, this chap had decided that he could get more out of this prototype than a retinal implant. We got, wow, I'm impressed. Um, she could see her own arm. And the one that really got me, we had a guy with a guide dog. And he looked down and he said, there you are, girl. He'd never seen her before. So, real impact. Where are we trying to take these? Well, we, we, we are trying to take these to, obviously, an end product. We're trying to take this to a platform where we're not just talking about a, a pair of glasses. We're talking about a wearable device that we can add functionality onto so that we can offer turn-by-turn -turn directions, so we can add some more semantic value to things, as Stephen suggested. We are currently going through a series of more user testing, and we're looking for testing partners. We're going through, as Stephen suggested, a review of the hardware development, what is now out there. We're two years down the line now, uh, and is there technology advances there that we should be making use of? Can we partner with some of the, the, the speakers of yesterday and today? Um, we're also looking at how we're going to distribute these things, how we're going to make them available to people that need them in the best possible way. That might be through RLB channels, it might be through NHS channels, High Street, we're, we're evaluating all that. Um, and Stephen's group is spinning out a company to, to create these devices and they're looking for investment. And, and that just about sums it up and wraps it up. So. On behalf of both of us, thank you very much indeed.